transformer via an average attention network. So it was published by three authors, three Chinese authors from the Beijing University. Um, and it's also a pretext to talk about the New World Transformer, uh, which was um, published by Google a year ago in the paper Attention is All You Need. And so the agenda for this presentation is to like, talk about attention networks and their derivatives, self-attention, multi-head attention, and average attention, but also uh, to talk about some of the encodings that are used in these models, uh, including positional and bipair encoding. So, okay. So in its origins, the attention model was uh, mainly used at the interface between the uh, decoder and the encoder in the uh, machine learning translation task. Uh, and besides the uh, great improvement in, uh, in the results that it brought to the task of translation, it also had a very nice uh, uh, visualization and interpretation um, feature. Uh, so in this original example, when you translate I am a student to je suis un étudiant, you can see that at each step of the uh, decoding of the uh, uh, target sentence, you could look at the attention weights uh, that are actually how the model is looking at the source sentence to predict the following token. Uh, and so here, uh, all, this, all these decoding uh, um, strategies start with an empty the, the token uh, start of sentence, the S here. And you could see that um, the, the words that are going to be looked at are weighted by these scores here. Uh, and so here there is an exact mapping between I and Joe, which is the first uh, word of the sentence. Uh, but you can understand that when you're translating a sentence, you need to have the context of maybe other words. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. You may need the other words of the sentence. And so that's why it would make sense to uh, embed the whole source sentence at every step of the decoding. Uh, and a naive way to do that uh, would be, for example, to, to consider just the average of all the input words representation. So in this I am a student translation task, you could just take the average of all the input words and embeddings in the English language and try to decode from that. Uh, that is smart, but What's actually much smarter is to realize that at every decoding step, uh, you need to, uh, to attend different parts of the sentence. Uh, and so that's where attention comes from. Uh, it's actually uh, the, the task of uh, building a context vector that is a linear representation of all the uh, values uh, that correspond to the, the embedding of each of the words of the source sentence. Uh, but the smart thing about that is that you don't weigh them the same way. You learn a function uh, that combines uh, a query to all the keys, which are the uh, corresponding inputs in the source sentence, and that will give you this weight. So, yeah, the general formulation of an attention model is to say that you have a, a, a query uh, that corresponds to the token you decoded up to in the sentence. Uh, and you also have uh, the, the key, which is uh, what are going to be my uh, target candidates that I'm going to use to decode the next token. Um, and so in this way, you see that you can you use these word embeddings twice. Uh, the first time is just to compute the score, so how much am I going to use this token? And the second time is just to multiply all these scores that you uh, obtain with the corresponding uh, embedding, which gives you the final context vector, which is going to be really the essential block that you will use to predict your next, uh, uh, your next token in the sentence. Um, and the essential uh, thing that you have to remember about uh, the attention is that it's just concatenating the, the embedding that you've decoded up to with this context vector. And um, the idea of today's paper is uh, actually to uh, take back this naive 
representation uh, of the of just averaging the these embeddings and saying that in the latest paper that Google released about the neural transformer, we can actually make this approximation, uh, which gives a similar results on, on, the, on, on the tasks, but that are much less expensive to compute. Because this task, though it's very optimal and very uh, seducing um, in, in its way to function, you, you still have to do this transformation, which is not as simple sometimes as just a scalar product. Sometimes it's something that is a bit more expensive. So we might just as well, as well say uh, that for some parts in the model, not all, but we, we're just going to use this average naive representation of the sentence. And so, um, yeah, sorry, but, uh, yeah. originally, so the, the different mechanisms at the beginning that were used was the, uh, were these two mechanisms. Uh, you see that they essentially did the same thing, that they computed these weights here, uh, and the context vector on top of that. And the way these mechanisms essentially differed were uh, how they handled the context vector, where you would put that in the network. So you see that this, for this first attention mechanism, it was inputted at the bottommost layer of the decoder, whereas here, it was inputted uh, was inputted in, in the topmost layer of the decoder. And the, also the, the parts that differed in these attention mechanisms were, were the non-linearities that were used. So here you had the TANH uh, function, but here you had uh, an RN cell. That was, that was the, two uh, the two essential ways that differ attention mechanism uh, at that time. But Google engineers realized that actually the attention was so powerful that they took it to the next level and they put attention uh, at, diff at, at different parts in the, in the uh, translation model and, and that made, made it really strong. So that's this slide. Uh, which, and what's actually very seducing is that it removes the need for recurrent neural networks uh, which were so far the best performing models but that had the problem that it were, they were hard to parallelize because a recurrent uh, cell in a, in a learning model, it has to work on all the inputs over one after another. Uh, and that's not parallelizable, so that's problematic for uh, the performance, the uh, training and decoding. So one thing that puzzled me when I when I look first at, at this uh, at this new model was how do you actually decode with an RNN? Uh, so I just found this uh, animation which um, might be uh, clarifying some things for you. It clarified a lot for me. But so to explain what's going on a bit in there, it's you have your input sentence, uh, your encoder. So and whatever it is, it. it it gives you a fixed representation of all your, your words in your input sentence. So that is fixed, and now you try to decode uh, to decode the sentence so one token after another. Um, and it works a bit, actually, just like the uh, LSTM decoder. So every time you uh, output something in the decoder, it will serve as an input for the next token to be predicted. The fact that it works without a recurrent neural network is because they use something called uh, masked attention, which enables you to have different number of inputs in the bottommost layer, but the model still works. There isn't a recurrent uh, layer, so that was the thing that was puzzling me. Is you haven't a recurrent layer, but still it can work with different size of inputs. So. I, I hope it clarifies a, a bit the working process in there, uh, but that's, that's just a big idea. Uh, and so the full model is actually actually looks like this, uh, and here we recognize the classical uh, interface between the, the decoder and the encoder, uh, where the, uh, each uh, tokens decoded so far is used as a query. And uh, all of these are the keys and the values that are combined to create the context vector. So that's the classical attention we had seen so far. But the, 
great addition of this paper is to introduce something called self-attention, which is called self-attention because here the, the query is equal to the key, which is equal to the value, which differs to what we had so far. The key was the value, so here the key was the value, and the query was the, uh, they were in different parts of the, of the model. So what does it mean, query equal, equal, equal key equal value? I will tell a bit more about that in a few slides, but essentially to, uh, uh, to enhance the, inform the mutual information between the different words of the sentence, uh, you explicitly create uh, a context vector from the other words of the sentence. So you, you, ask to, you explicitly concatenate the current embedding of your word with a linear representation a linear combination of all the words in the same sentence. That's why it's called self-attention. And though it's used for um, translation tasks, this kind of embedding is also successful, can also be used actually, self-attention, in uh, any uh, natural language processing task, uh, just like the, pa the paper you mentioned, uh, Peter, uh, where they, they take birds to, uh, to use this self-attention model. So I'm going to present the model, uh, to, to make it coherent, I'm going to present this model bottom-up, in a bottom-up fashion, so starting with, you see on the uh, bottom right uh, part, I'm going to go from the input embeddings to uh, up to explaining all of the layers in there. Uh, so the first thing they talk about, so we, we discussed about this embedding a bit uh, with Stefan uh, last week, uh, which is the byte pair encoding, uh, which is the first brick of this model. Um, and I, I just wanted to do this table. So this is a, a table of mine. I think it's very like it's very coarse in its description, but it's just uh, byte pair encoding. So is a data compression technique uh, that is used to um, um, transform uh, the naive one note embedding of all the words into something a bit smarter. Uh, compression techniques such as the Huffman algorithm had been used before, but the problem of this, the Huffman, the way Huffman algorithm was was used to uh, embed the, the, the words was that the input of the algorithm was all the words and their frequencies, and uh, the output was just the uh, uh, embeddings of these of these words, but regardless of any subword representation. Whereas the byte pair encoding and uh, it really try, it, it finds the closest characters uh, in terms of frequency in the text and gathers them together under the same token and so it keeps that subword representation. Um, what we have to note about that is that it, it's not a continuous embedding, it's still something that is uh, one not encoded at the end. Uh, this is to compare with the, I think, the character level and subword level embeddings which are something that is learned in, in a continuous way. Now the next great addition, I think, of this paper is the positional encoding. So why don't, do we need positional encoding? Uh, it's simply because uh, when you're going to do your context vector, that is going to take all of the other words in the sentence, you also need to uh, provide some information about some positional information. With RNNs, with uh, recurrent neural networks, we didn't need that because we had the, the uh, we had the sequential model that was keeping track of the state, but that was also like keeping some sort of memory and, and uh, you had this sequential information that was naturally embedded in there. Uh, but when you, when you use attention model, the context vector that you create, it's just a linear combination of, of the world. And so you have no way to know, uh, uh, to know how close to the world you are, unless you provide an additional positional meeting. Uh, and so the idea is to, the idea they, they uh, suggested is to use the, the original input embedding and just to add a, a positional encoding. So for any word vector, I am a student, for any word in the sentence, you add the corresponding positional encoding uh, so you have a certain uh, 
coordinate, scalar coordinate to uh, each coordinate of the vector. And so what I'm doing here is simply the, uh, the sinusoid uh, sin of x uh, sampled over uh, 20 different points, which are the 20 words of the sentence. And this would be the corresponding scalar value. So I am a student will be the offset that would be added to the original representation of the world. Um, to be more accurate, what they actually do is that they take multiple frequencies. Um, and for any word in the sentence, the positional encoding, the offset that you would uh, add to each of your vector, corresponds to a, a vertical stripe like the one depicted on, on this picture. Uh, so for example, the student word would be uh, up each of the coordinates would be offset in this manner. And what's interesting about this positional encoding is that basic trigonometry uh, formulas give you that uh, there is a linear transformation between, uh, between two of these embeddings given a fixed distance in the sentence. What it means is that going from 4 to 6 would be the same linear transformation as going from 10 to 12 or from 13 to 15. Which is a nice feature we want to have because if we learn uh, a combination between uh, how two words interact to predict the next word or whatever, we want to have uh, this invariance uh, regardless of the, posi the absolute position of the, of the uh, word in the sentence. We want to have this relative relativity between our words and our position. And the other nice feature about this kind of encoding is that it's uh, centered around zero, so it doesn't uh, corrupt too much the initial data. Because remember, we add this positional embedding to the original one. How did they figure this out? Seems like a little random to me. Um, they, they said they had another strategy, which I, which I don't remind really well, but mostly they didn't really uh, justify it apart from what I explained, uh, but they, and, and just verify this experimentally, I guess. Okay. Um, so this is the actual formula, but the, the only thing to remember is that you make the frequency vary and you sample it in a vertical fashion. So going to what's actually really important in this paper is its self-attention. Uh, and so here is a very coarse representation of, uh, of a different neural networks model. In the traditional multi-layer per structure, uh, you, would have for, uh, you would have to go from one layer to another, a bit of all of the inputs mixed up, but no really explicit uh, usage of, of your neighboring words. Uh, in RNN, this is uh, way better because you, you have these uh, states evolving uh, with these little rows, uh, which make the, the prediction of the words uh, be dependent on the previous and, and the previous word and the current embedding. Um, and what self attention doing is basically you have your your current input of your word that you've embedded like on its own, regardless of all the words of the sentence. And you are going to concatenate it with this guy, which is an explicit combi combination, linear combination of all, all of these other words. Uh, it, is, uh, it is the context vector that we talked about, so it is really a, a, a linear combination of these values, okay? Um, this, this is a combination of the, of the column vectors, whereas here, for instance, it was a matrix multiplication, uh, which was not considering the vector as a whole, but all the coordinates uh, independently. So for the varying lengths, is, I mean, is there just like a max length and then they mask out like, the inputs where you have sentences less of that length? Or so, How does that work exactly? Um, so attention is a, uh, is a process that works uh, uh, regardless of the length of the sentence because there is a, uh, a normalizing, uh, there is a softmax that normalizes all the weights. 
So you can theoretically have uh, as many uh, keys in your dictionary as you want, uh, as long as you normalize them in the end to one. Uh, and when we talk about masked, when they talked about the masked uh, attention, um, it's because all the uh, it's because they will put the, uh, systematically some weights to zero in the sentence, um, and so they will normalize according to that. If that makes sense. Uh, only, only the, the so the max attention is only used in the decoder to prevent to prevent actually a leftward flow information. So the fact that uh, when you want to decode a certain token, uh, you don't have information about the next one, and how do you write that somewhere in the model? Is just to say that you only care about this this first uh, token, so you mask everything out. Max the okay. future of the sentence. Yeah, you must you must the future of the sentence when you train. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand like the input is a varying length, but we're not using RNA. Yeah, the, this is what this was the the purpose of the first animated uh, image I showed. Um, yeah. Um, uh, we might come back to that uh, at the end of the presentation. Okay, sounds good. Uh, and so the these uh, edges that I represent here, uh, you might sometimes refer to them as one by one convolution, or uh, position wise uh, uh, fit for one network. Uh, why it's called position wise is because these uh, transformations are just. Uh, Providing a, your embedding with a further uh, uh, a further transformation, but regardless of all the other interaction. So if you see one by one convolution or position wise with forward network, it just means that it's just a regular transformation, but without interaction. And now, so this is not uh, so this is not a kind of attention. It's just a way to the attention, just like the first. Uh, thing I showed on an early slide, uh, they actually realized that uh, instead of having just one attention layer, uh, you could uh, deduplicate these uh, attention cells uh, at, from, at the same level, you know, but just for them to learn individual um, mode of, uh, of the sentence. Uh, so this is also something that they verified experimentally. They said, oh, okay, we, we get better results by, uh, instead of being just one big attention layer, to have multiple layers that can attend to uh, different uh, portions of the sentence. So that's what is called and referred to as multi-head attention. It's because, uh, for example, the first set of attention will, will attend uh, uh, the early parts of the sentence will be trained to attend the early parts of the sentence. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what are the different effects, uh, but it makes sense to think that if you separate them, if you isolate them, they will be more able to learn uh, tasks, uh, specific tasks of the sentence. Okay, so this is the first and so, yeah, the, the, la the last uh, arrow that is here, the yellow arrow, is just the one-by-one -one, uh, convolution that I mentioned before, the position-wise without interaction. And notice that I, I think I haven't mentioned that before, but this is the, the actual uh, transformer is repeating this block six times, so n, n equals six. six uh, and so coming back to uh, the actual uh, paper that we're discussing about today, uh, they're, what they're doing is just they're replacing this masked multi-head attention by an average attention. They keep the multi-head attention proposed in the paper here and there, but they argue that with uh, changing just this layer uh, gives a decoding time uh, speed up. Uh, so if you remember from slide two, this is just doing this naive uh, Averaging of the input elements. So now, uh, to, to, end, to end this presentation, I will do a little uh, complexity analysis uh, 
of uh, the different uh, models that we have uh, seen so far. Um, what's interesting when you compare complexity are these three uh, parameters. Uh, so the complexity per layer is the number of total operations that you have to do to go from layer one to layer two. Uh, but this can usually be parallelized and it's usually perf performed by GPUs. Sequential operation, on the other hand, is something that you uh, anyway have to do in a sequential way. And so when you, when you have uh, recurrent uh, cells, for instance, you have to do uh, O of big O of N operation, which is N is the length of the sentence. And the maximum path length is if you want to provide a um, uh, correspondence between any two words of the sentence, how long is the, is the distance that you have to travel uh, to make these embeddings uh, share some relation? And if you have a recurrent network, the worst case scenario is you have to go from word one to word n, and you have to execute your LSTM cell n times. Uh, and so actually, I'm, I'm going to explain a bit more what, what is this difference here between the two complexities. Uh, so there is this, in the recurrent layer, what you do is essentially you multiply the n, so i n a student, n is the length of the sentence, and the d is the dimension of the embedding. And whenever you do a transformation, you multiply, uh, you multiply this by a d by d matrix, which gives you this complexity. But when you're doing self-attention, um, it's no longer a matrix multiplication. What you do is you multiply each uh, line, uh, you, you do the dot product between each of these lines. Uh, and so doing this dot product is of complexity D. But then for each word, you have to look at each of the other words. So this, this is why the Routian square comes from. Now, you, if you see, if you look at the uh, accelerating, uh, the average attention network paper, the, the complexity here is, is not what's written, it's actually, n, instead of being n squared d, it's n squared d plus n d squared. But that's just because they not only look at the attention layer, they look at the, at the block uh, of uh, attention uh, of the model. So uh, also this, uh, this uh, position-wise embedding that we have. And so, to remind just a, a bit why there is a speed up, it's because for any word that you are going to translate, instead of having to compute all the weights against all the previous words of the sentence and forming the corresponding vector, uh, your context vector is just an average of all the previous ones. And with dynamic programming, you can just do that very efficiently by keeping a running uh, sum of, uh, of all the inputs and, and just normalizing by the correct number of them. So that's, that's really a much faster operation, though it's more approximate, but if it doesn't impair the model in any way, it's worth uh, considering. And so that's all for this presentation. This is, oh, okay, so this is the table that is summing it up. And what was interesting here was uh, restricted self-attention, uh, which is just, you could do attention on a, just on a specific window of the sentence uh, instead of the whole sentence. You could do, just do a, a window of size R and do attention on that. And there was also the, the convolution, uh, but this is a good exercise just to think about why this is log k of n uh, uh, for uh, the convolution where you have a certain kernel n. How do I uh, make different words in the sentence uh, share embeddings? Uh, so yeah, but mainly this is all for this presentation. Uh, the takeaway is that I think the transformer model looks very promising in terms of speed ups, and that uh, in some settings the complexity introduced by some models might be unnecessary. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, I just have, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, 
I uh, just like the slide before. Um, yeah. When we call the complexity, I'm not sure if you understand the difference between uh, AANN and AAN class. So can you just detail that? Yeah, so um, I think ANN is something that they uh, actually don't use. Uh, but this is the uh, this is the original way that uh, average attention network uh, uh, was formulated, and this is a, a thing different, fundamentally different in the way it was the pain and mask. And I was a bit puzzled by why do you have this uh, big O of n sequential operation? Uh, I I cannot detail the I cannot give the details right now. Uh, if you look at the paper, it's a bit uh, obscure, but it's explained. Uh, I got it at some point. I'm sorry, I cannot detail that. But uh, 